Welcome to my kitchen. I'm Debbie Davis, University of Missouri 4-H Youth Specialist, and I work in the Northwest region of Missouri, officed in Clinton County and serve Caldwell and DeKalb counties. I love cooking and I love making pies. I have a few secrets I'd like to share with you. Making successful pies can be really easy, but it does take some practice and there's some tips I'd like to share with you. So if you'd like to get your ingredients together, you're going to need all-purpose flour, you're going to need salt, you're going to need solid shortening, we're going to need some ice water. So you could just go ahead and put some ice, several ice cubes in a cup, probably going to need about a cup of water in that. I'm going to show you how to measure solid shortening with a cup of water and a measuring cup. So you decide how you're going to measure your shortening. You'll need two thirds of a cup. And we're going to sift our flour. Now, you might not have a sifter, but let me show you what you could use instead. This is a um, wire mesh strainer, and that would work just as well. So if you'd like to go get your ingredients and come back and we will start making pie. Let's get started making that pie crust. We're going to start by sifting our flour. Sifting flour is important when a recipe calls for it, and pie crust does. And let's just see why. It's not to get lumps out. We're going to start with roughly what looks like a cup of, well, let's just measure it accurately. Take a flat edge and take the excess off and scrape it off. And we're going to put that cup of flour in a sifter. And again, it's wire mesh. that and let's measure it now and see how much we have. I'm just going to take this and start filling back my one cup dry measure. Uh-oh. It's kind of magic. Look how much more flowers there. There's not more flour, there's more air. So we've made it a lighter product. So let's level this off. And now we're going to put that first cup into my measuring or mixing bowl. And let's measure and let's try it this way. My strainer. I put wax paper down to make it easy to funnel back the flour into my measuring cup. Again, recipes may not call for sifting flour, so don't, because it does, as you can tell, make a difference in the measurement. It also makes a difference in the product. Cakes will require sifted flour. Delicate pastries, such as pie crust. And looky there. Same thing happened just with my strainer. We're going to have excess flour. We're going to scrape it back into the flour container. And there we go, we have two cups of flour. My recipe calls for two-thirds cup solid shortening. But what we're going to do before we add the shortening is add our salt. Salt will add flavoring. We need a half teaspoon for this recipe. And it needs to be a level half measure. And I'm going to use this cup. Oh my gosh, I spilled it but I had something to catch it and I wasn't measuring over my bowl. So we're going to level that off. That's exactly a half teaspoon. Put this aside. We're through with the salt. I'm going to leave the flour out. We might need it in a little bit. I'm going to show you a trick to measuring solid shortening. I have a fork and I'm just going to lightly mix the salt and the flour. This is messy. This is not easy to measure. I need two-thirds of a cup. So there's a water displacement method, and you can see that I have one cup of water in the liquid measuring cup because I can get down and look at eye level, and I see the level of the water is exactly one cup, and sometimes in the middle the miscus can, can fool you, and you want to be able to see across that. So that's a cup of water. I'm going to put enough of the solid shortening in there 
until the water level rises to, what would it be if I need two thirds of a cup of shortening? We start out with a cup of water and the solid fat displaces the volume of water. This is a little science here. There's an Aesop fable about the raven that was extremely thirsty and all he could find was a tall thin neck jug that had water in the bottom and finally he figured out if he started throwing pebbles in that the water level would rise to the top and he could get a drink. So let's see, I should be at one and two thirds of with my water level. I'm going to check that. That's great. Now, I don't want that water in that flour at all. So I'm going to set this aside and I'm going to drain this. Let me show you how I'm going to drain it. I'm going to hold it back. And just try to make sure all of the moisture is out. There may be a little bit in there, but it's so much easier to measure it this way. So let's get rid of this bowl. Now, this is a step that you can do a lot of mixing without affecting the quality of your pie crust. Now, pies are sometimes a little threatening for people. To make a good pie it does take some experience and also takes uh, understanding why pie crusts are tender and flaky. So I need some tools. I can find my pastry blender. A pastry blender, you can see this, has, they're not super sharp, but they're fairly sharp blades, or you can use two forks. And you're going to start cutting the shortening into the flour and salt mixture. See, it's just kind of messy. So we're just going to keep cutting it in. If I didn't have a pastry blender, then I could use the two forks. And I'll just show you how you would do that. Now this step really needs a lot of attention and time because you're going to make sure that the fat is coating as many of the flour particles as possible. Hmm, and you're going, and why is that, Debbie? For a tender crust, let's pretend that the brown is the fat and the flour are the red lines. If we can keep those the flour separated as long as possible before it moisture hits it and then when it bakes then the fat dissolves we'll have a tender flaky crust so the fat is actually helping separate those flour particles we do not want tough pie crust so I'm going to keep working this and you can see it's changing appearance it's going to look like what we call coarse cornmeal and this will take a few minutes to do but look at that it's already changing I said we're going to make a two crust pie. I have a cherry pie filling ready to put in the pie after we get it assembled and put into the pie pan. My oven is preheating. So there's several things you can do to make sure that you have that scrumptious pie ready to eat as soon as possible. Can you see how this looks? It is almost powdery. So take your time and make sure you cut in, this is called cutting in the fat into the flour. Remember I told you to have some ice ready to put water with it? Well, we're ready for that step next. We're ready for our next step in making our uh, wonderful pie. I'd like to take this closer to the camera so you can see how fine this is. wouldn't believe it there's some solid fat in there so that is that's how soft it should be 
and your forks or your pastry blender can make that happen. So we're ready to be prepared to roll out our pie dough in just a few minutes. Let's talk about the kind of pan that you're going to need for your pie. Guys, pie pans come in all kinds of materials, sizes, can be baking dish. So this is really one of my favorite pies, especially for cherry pie, because sometimes the juice runs around the edge, and rather than getting all over the oven, it will this extra lip helps save some of my juice. So I'm going to use that. Dull finish is really the best because you're baking this for a long time and you don't want shiny reflection because the shiny will make it uh, brown faster. And if you're baking for an hour at a fairly hot temperature, you can have a burnt pie crust pretty easily. So dull finished aluminum and baking dishes are really quite good. They absorb the heat well. What size should you make? Well here, when you're following a recipe, it will tell you eight, nine, 10 inch pie, and it will tell you that on the bottom of the pan. This is a nine inch size, and this is a little bit smaller, eight inch, and if you don't use the right size pie pan, obviously this would be too small, you'd have extra pie filling. So follow your directions in your recipe. The other important thing is try to avoid adding more flour into your pie dough as you roll it out or flatten it. And I like to use what we call a pastry cloth. This one's even very helpful because it has the size of the circle that I would need to roll out to fit into my pie pan. A good rolling pin, I've had this one since college. and. That's been a few decades ago. So a good rolling pin can be one of those lifetime investments or gifts. I also don't want to work any more flour into that, so I'm kind of again protecting it. I'm going to put a stocking on the rolling pin. These are sold in sets, rolling pin cover and pastry cloth. You don't have to have them, but if you're going to make a lot of pies and you want to be consistently successful, I think these are a great asset and a great tool to have in your uh, kitchen. Okay, we are about ready to get started. So I'm going to set that pie pan right over here. I have the flour because I'm going to work some flour into the pastry cloth. And you're going to see it disappear. You can see that there's some in there. I'm just going to rub it in all around and this is going to help keep it from sticking. And that's why we do put the, you know, a little extra flour on the countertops so it won't stick. But you know what? You could also probably put a little solid shortening on there to keep it from sticking and not having to add more flour to it. I also need a little flour into my pastry cloth. Now this is all disappearing. And I'm going to scoot all that to the side. It's not going to stick on me. You know, and I said it's disappearing. I can pick this up and it stays in the cloth. It's a heavy canvas fabric. And I've even, when I've taught pie classes, I, we, I would make some pastry cloths for the students and we would have these stockinette covers too. So that's just a helpful tip. I told you in the beginning that these are, are gonna be some tips to help you have consistently successful pies. We have our cut in flour, flour and fat. And we have the salt for flavoring. We're going to add a tablespoon at a time of ice water. Remember, we have fat in here. We want it to stay solid until it hits the oven to avoid tough pie crust. So I'm going to add, to begin with, I'm going to add about seven tablespoons of water. And you're probably wondering why I say about seven and my recipe directions I called for was anywhere from seven to 12 tablespoons of water. Flour has an absorbency depending upon where the wheat was raised, the humidity of the day when you're actually cooking. There's all types of fac factors that varies the amount of water that it's going to take to make this pastry the right consistency. This is where experience and practice come in. I want to minimize 
the amount of time that I work this dough, it's not play dough. We don't want to pretend that it's a dev. I'm using a fork and lightly stirring. The key is to know when it starts pulling away from the sides of the bowl and it will form a ball. This is about right. And again, if you were here and you were with me, you could see that it very lightly holds together. That's excellent. Too wet, it's not good and too dry is tough. So it's just this perfect consistency when it starts to pull away and what we call clean the side of the bowl. So you can see that it's forming a ball on its own. I'm going to add just a little bit more because there's still some dry crumbs down here. Were you keeping track of how many tablespoons? Probably close to 12. I've been talking and I didn't keep track. But I just know from my experience, there we have it, there it is, okay. So we have, the ball is formed, I'm going to put it all out and pat it together. Again, I'm trying very hard just to be light with it. Let it form a ball and you're just going to press it together. We're not pounding, we're trying to be gentle with this. And it's really mistaken when we say we're going to roll it out, we're really flattening. Again, consider, think about being more gentle. Try to move some things away so you can see a little bit better. I need to make this into a ball and I'm just gently shaping it and forming it. And it's in the center of my circle. But this is a two crust pie. So I need to only roll out half of it for the bottom crust. And you can see I'm, I'm gently playing with it. And I'm going to flatten it by taking my hand and making, there we go, my rolling pin, flatten from center out. And you're going to be go around your ball like spokes of a wheel and you're just going to flatten from the center outward all the way around. We're not pressing hard, we're lightly flattening the dough and I have my handy little guide that's helping me keep it in a circle and the size that I need but you know if I didn't have that printed on my canvas or my pastry cloth, how would I know when it's big enough? How about if I take my pan and turn it upside down? There has to be allowance for it to drop down in the pan, so we're going to roll it out just a little bit larger. Can you see here? A little bit beyond Try to keep it in a circle. There we go. Now another trick. This is why I love my pastry cloths because it makes it so easy to transfer the pie crust into the pie pan. This could be tricky. But if I just roll it up and remember I worked the flour into the pastry cloth so it's not sticking but I didn't work a lot of extra flour into the pastry. It's all on my rolling pin and I just unroll it and let it drop down into my pie pan. Be careful and don't stretch. Pick up the pie crust and let it settle down into your pan. And we're going to be ready to put the filling in. And I'll get the filling ready and come back in a minute. We are back and ready to assemble our pie. And I've got the top crust rolled out. Remember, this is a two crust pie. And it's going to be the same size, so I've rolled it to make it a little bit bigger than my pie pan. I've got my filling ready. 
And let's get this pie ready to put in the oven. You could use, this is a two crust pie. Uh, all kinds of fruit pies are, are two crust. You could have a canned pie filling. I have my own cherry tree in my yard and I pick a lot of cherries every year and I put them in the freezer so I can have fresh cherry pie throughout the year. So I have my cherries with their juice. It's a thickened mixture. Have that placed in there. And now we're going to transfer that crust and put it on here. But first I need about two tablespoons of butter. The recipe calls to put just pieces of butter around the top of the fruit before I put my top crust in. And you can use margarine, but I prefer to cook with butter. This has a great flavor and it is animal fat. But you know what? Pie deserves the best. Set that knife aside. I'm going to need that in a few minutes. So let's put that top crust on. Again, rolling it up on the rolling pin gently. Move this over so you can see a little bit better. We're going to unroll it and start it so that the edges match up. And there we go. This next step I'm going to put up on top of my canister so you can see a little bit better what I'm doing. We're not quite finished. The next step is the fluting. And you turn the top crust over. So I turn that over all the way around first. Tuck it in. We'll just call it tuck it in. Get the edges kind of pinched together. If they hang over, I've learned with this pie pan, if I'll just trim, give it a haircut, pastry cut. If I trim the extras off, then I have about the right amount of pastry that I can tuck under. And then I can make that decorative edging. It's called fluting. Remember I told you this pie pan is great for my cherry pies because it kind of catches those extra drips? Fluting seals the edges together. And then you just take your fingers and create a pattern. Again, with practice, you will find what works for you. I just take my thumb and poke it between my index fingers and I go all the way around. I'm going to turn this carefully. Don't want to knock it off. My oven is at 450. That's a hot oven. It's going to take about 40 minutes. And remember the process in that hot oven is that as the heat hits it there'll be steam made and that'll create layers with that fat separating them. And that's what makes our pies tender and flaky. When you're judging or looking at quality pie crust, you want to take a piece of pie crust and see those layers in there. My pie is almost ready to go in the oven, but it needs vent holes in the top. And you could create whatever you would like. I think I'll do a four and an H. I could do a four leaf clover even. But let's just make it quick. I think a four leaf clover. And then I'm going to put some little cuts into the pie all the way around, kind of make a border. But the this will let the steam es escape. The steam is going to create the layers. Another trick is to take a little bit of milk and a pastry brush and lightly brush the top of your crust. This will help make a beautiful brown, golden brown crust. This is one of those grandma tricks or tips. 
and just a little bit just to kind of put a glaze on it okay and I think you can see my four and my H one more tip because the oven's hot and we're going to have it in there for 40 minutes I like to protect my crust because it's up and it may burn easily these are some aluminum rings that fit different size pies this is the one that fits this size pie the nine inch pie or you could take aluminum foil and create a collar that just covers the crust all the way around so you can do that that way I'm going to use these I've adjusted my racks in the oven so that my pie will be in the center of the oven, not too, not close to the top and not close to the bottom. You want that heat to circulate and you want it to be centered in the oven. Put that in there. Set my timer for 40 minutes. And we'll be back for a finished pie. Well, we're back. I have a baked cherry pie. Let me share this with you. This cover around the crust comes off about 10 minutes before the baking time is up. And your times on your pies will say maybe 45 or 50 minutes. It'll give you a range. Always check at that first uh, time that they tell you. Ovens vary. So it beautiful golden brown, beautiful crust and my 4-H is very visible. So there's the baked cherry pie. We're going to make a single crust pie and I have a chocolate filling for this crust. A little bit different steps that we're going to be doing and we're going to be making a meringue for that chocolate pie. So I followed the recipe for a single crust pie. All of these recipes are available in Better Homes and Garden or just good uh, traditional cookbooks and you can find those online or you can email me if you have questions. My email address is davisdd at m-i-s-s-o-u-r-i dot edu. Be happy to an answer any questions. So I have my crust transferred into my pan. This time we're going to bake our shells separately. I'm going to finish fluting the edges And we also have to do a step called um, creating steam holes in the crust because this is going to bake first before we add the filling and the meringue. So making the pretty fluting around the edges to make a finished look and also to make a nice edge for your meringue to seal onto. So there we are, but we're not ready to put it in the oven yet. It's a very hot oven and it's only eight to 10 minutes. Take a fork and just prick all along the bottom of the pie sh shell on the sides a little bit and across the bottom. Remember that steam that puffs, the, puffs up the pastry and makes the layers? Well that needs to escape. So we're going to put this in, set the timer for, I'm going to set it for eight minutes and check. Put it in the middle of the oven. And that will be ready in just a few minutes. But in the meantime, we have some work to do to prepare the meringue. I already have my filling ready. We're making a chocolate meringue pie. And I tried to use the ingredients I had at home tonight. And I have made it uh, from a recipe, chocolate filling. Or you might find a, a box, an instant, or ones that are cooked. So whatever flavor you want to put in there, you can make banana cream. There's all kinds of ideas for cream pies. To make that cream pie topping the meringue, we're going to need to separate eggs. And this can be a little tricky, so I thought we ought to take some time and discuss how we can do that, because if there's any yolk that is in the egg whites, it, they won't beat up. So I'm going to show you a couple of ways to separate. The eggs need to be at room temperature. And I'm kind of old-fashioned, I just kind of hit the eggs on the edge of the counter and I'm going to show you the first way. Kind of unhinge your shells 
and let the white slip out. Uh-oh, I got some shell in there. So I'm going to take that shell out and I'm going to keep moving that back and forth and I am through and here's where my egg yolk is going to go. You see it broke but it did not get in my whites. I'm going to wash my hands. I'm trying to be very careful and clean. I'm going to put this, the clean egg white, into my bowl that I'm going to be mixing in a minute. I'm doing this to, in case I have a problem and the yolk breaks on me in the next egg that I'm separating, I won't contaminate my egg whites. So let's crack this egg and let's use a cute little tool called an egg separator. I think you can see it has the area for the egg white to drip through and the egg yolk stays in the little cup in the middle. Again, make sure you don't get any shells in there. This might be a little bit easier. A good egg has kind of a elastic or yeah, white. And that egg yolk didn't break. So we're going to put it there, put my egg whites there. And the last one, sometimes chefs use this. I don't recommend it unless you're really experienced and your hands have to be extremely clean. Let the egg yolk slide through your fingers. And there you have three ways to separate eggs. Messy though. Wash my hands well. Soapy water. Dry them off. Kind of clean up my mess here. And we'll get the eggs out of the way. For meringue, I need three egg whites at room temperature. I need a half teaspoon of vanilla. I need a fourth of a teaspoon of cream of tartar. And I need six tablespoons of sugar. So let's get started making meringue. Doesn't look like much egg whites. We're going to add the fourth teaspoon of cream of tartar. Cream of tartar is an acid and it helps to stabilize the egg whites. We just put that quarter of a teaspoon in cream of tartar, my electric beater, now you could get real, have a lot of exercise and do this by hand with your whisk, and let me show you the tool that we call the whisk, and you can do it with your hand whisk, it has lots of wires in it and you would beat it, but I'm going to do the easy way and we're going to beat these until they are foamy and soft peaks and then we start adding the sugar. So we're going to begin real high. Now picking this up and allowing the egg whites to go into the corner so I can get the greatest volume and if you can listen, I'm really avoiding hitting the sides of the bowl. Because after all, we're beating air bubbles into the egg whites. It's all we're doing in increasing the volume. Using the cream of tartar is a great help. And also being at room temperature, and absolutely no yolk. Also, your bowl needs to be glass. Plastic retains fats. And I'm going to check my pie shell. I just like to check it. Now, this is what we would call soft peaks. You can see how it comes up and it falls over, but it's still holding its shape. This next step is really important. A lot of people struggle with meringues. But as I told you at the beginning of this series, just a few handy tips and you can have successful pies all the time. I have six tables of sugar measured out. I 
key is to sprinkle the sugar on and add it gradually and allowing it to dissolve as you continue beating. You're going to beat these until they are um, stiff peaks. So let's keep beating and I'll sprinkle sugar in. There's one tablespoon. Again, we're trying to avoid the sides of the bowl. I like to beat it for at least a full minute. Here's number two. And this is a standard meringue recipe. Meringue is nothing more than beaten egg whites, sugar, vanilla, and a little bit of cream of tartar, the quarter teaspoon. Helps stabilize those egg whites. A lemon meringue pie, lime meringue pie, you can even put meringue on banana. Oh, and coconut cream pie. Oh my goodness, think of all the great pies that you could make. I've taught many classes of pie making to 4-H youth over the years, and I had one young lady that actually started a pie making business. And she was very excited about that because she loved to make the pies, she was successful at it, and she had quite a nice business. It was really nice in the holiday time too. People love homemade pumpkin pies and for Thanksgiving, so she did quite well. Continuing to sprinkle. And I just, see how this is getting stiff? We're not quite finished. I still have a little more sugar to put in there, but it's really holding its shape nicely, and it's turning glossy. I'm going to take my rubber scraper and push the meringue in from the sides, and I think we are about finished. Reminder too, these are just air bubbles, so every time you bang the beaters against the sides of the bowl, you're breaking air bubbles. So treat it as it is, as a delicate topping for your beautiful pie. So you can see how stiffly they hold their shape. I can just about, they're not gonna fall out. There's my timer. Let's check the pie shell. Just another minute. While that's finishing, I have something else to share with you. I'm going to come closer to the camera. Leftover pie dough should never go to waste. A little butter and cinnamon and sugar on it and then bake it. Mm -mm. My mom called them Johnny Cakes and that's what my children grew up having as the scraps from the pie dough. But the cool thing is that you can actually see the layers and it will, I might make a mess here, but you can see the layers come across, open up there. Oh my gosh, isn't that cool? But that's what we're talking about is tender and flaky layers with your pie crust. And there you have, and this is just the standard recipe and I handled it lightly tried not to work too much flour in it and when the hot oven 450 degrees hits that pastry creates the steam pushes the layers apart the, the fat has protected the flour so it didn't develop too much gluten we want gluten in our yeast breads but not in our pies so let's pull this out I have a pie filling ready to go the good chocolate oh my gosh it's gonna be heavenly Oh, I forgot the vanilla. We need a half teaspoon of vanilla. And this is actually a fourth, so I'm going to use it twice and I should not measure over my bowl. So there's a fourth and a fourth. Good practice with your fractions as you cook. 
that needs to be blended. So I'm going to give it a couple of turns with the mixer. There we have. Let's set that aside and let's pull this baked pie shell out of the oven. I'm going to set it on the board to keep protect my table. Just lightly browned. I'm going to turn the oven temperature down to 375. It doesn't need to be quite so hot for the meringue and it will cool off quickly. We're going to put the pie filling in and then we're going to put that meringue on top. I hope you like chocolate pie as much as I do. You know, and you can make from what I call scratch or recipe with typical ingredients that you might have it on your shelf. I substituted cocoa for the chocolate squares that the recipe called for. You have there are directions on how you can do that. I'm going to get all of this off. And now I have chocolate on my rubber spatula. So I'll get a different one that's clean. And I want to seal this completely around the crust, so I'm going to put dollops, we'll call them, around and be able to spread this smooth. Isn't that pretty? See how it holds its shape? Those are stiff peaks. And we're going to put it in the oven for about eight minutes. And it's just going to turn a light golden brown. Now it's important to seal the meringue to the crust, to those fluted edges. It's holding its shape beautifully. You know, I mentioned the, the weather, the atmosphere, the temperature sometimes can have an effect on our cooking. And meringues can be a little challenging when it's real humid. But the cream of tartar helps to stabilize it in spite of the weather. So I'm making sure that the meringue, there's no holes between the meringue and the crust. And then I'm going to make some pretty peaks. I'm just going to take my spatula and just pull it up and let some little peaks form. You might like it smooth. I kind of like it swirled and a little design. Oh, that's pretty. It's important to have fun with our cooking. So there we have it, chocolate meringue pie, ready to go back in the oven, a little bit lower temperature for seven or eight minutes and it will lightly brown that meringue. May have to use my pot holders. Middle of the oven, I'm going to set the timer and we'll be back. Well we're finishing up our pie making lessons. I got two beautiful pies. I have this gorgeous chocolate meringue pie. Just came out of the oven a few minutes ago and has these beautiful golden peaks on it. And I have a luscious looking cherry pie. I'm very anxious to share these with my family tomorrow. Let me review some of the things I've shared with you in this session. It can be easy as pie you'll just um, practice some of the things I've shared. For that tender and flaky tr tr uh, pastry that we want, be sure to cut in that fat thoroughly. Pastry blender or two forks work just as well. Remember we want to keep that fat separating the flour po uh, particles. Use ice cold water when you do add the water. Mix only until it forms a ball and you're lightly tossing it until it forms a ball. The pastry cloth and the rolling pin cover are great friends of mine and I use them consistently with my pie making. And remember when you're you're not really rolling like Play-Doh, you're flattening if you'll use that term and keep that in your head, and you're rolling like the spokes of a wheel from the center outward to shape it into a circle. I forgot to mention there's no re-rolls in pie dough. 
the first time, and if you try to re-roll it, it just gets tough. So try to make sure that you follow the directions and you don't run into that problem. On the meringue, no yolk. You cannot have any yolk. If, separate your eggs like I did, one at a time. Don't mix it in with the others until you know that that one has no fat in it and you've kept the yolk intact. Uh, make sure that they're at room temperature and then gradually add that sugar after you've got those soft peaks formed. And then be sure to use that cream of tartar initially in your mixture and I think you'll have pretty good success. Happy pie making and it's easy as pie and please contact me D-A-V-I-S-D-D -D at M-I-S-S-O-U-R-I dot E-D-U. Happy baking. Mm -hmm.